My name is Matt Gordner. I'm the senior strategist at the Munether Initiative. With us today is Dr. Khalid Tanasti, who's the director of the Global Commission on Drug Policy, visiting fellow at the Global Studies Institute at the University of Geneva, and visiting fellow at the David F. Musto Center on Drug Policy Studies at the University of Shanghai. Thank you very much for being with us, Dr. Khalid Tanasti. Thank you, my honor. Uh, perhaps we can start off with an overview of Tunisia's drug law uh, and policies. Give us some historical context, if you don't mind. Thank you very much. I think that, Matt, it is important to remember that the current policy in Tunisia has been adopted in 1992. And I would say that it is because we have seen a wave of reforms of the policies and uh, of drug policies around the world, especially after the adoption of the 1988 convention, the UN Convention Against Illicit Trafficking and uh, in, psycho in Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances. So it is that very repressive environment that has been brought up and that have reflected on the policies on the ground in different countries, and especially in countries that have had already authoritarian regimes in place especially at the time after the coup d'etat in Tunisia in the late 80s. So if we go back to the whole system, so the objective of the international control regime has been adapted in a major public health intervention. It was against addressing um, addiction in the terminology of the time, we say today dependence and um, so addressing that was through changing the behaviors of human beings, making sure that they're not going to consume and that through repression, you can address the behavior of people. So it was about two legs, supply reduction and demand reduction. Now, for the pain relief, anesthesia has access to all the different substances, be it opiates, be it cannabis, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the regime has always walked on one leg, which is that of repression and of interdiction. Uh, Tunisia, of course, has put in place a very specific law in 1992, when that law 52 was quite famous around, uh, was quite known because it was basically the only one in the Arab world and around the African continent and around the Mediterranean to have mandatory sentencing of one year of prison. And it was not only because people had possession, but uh, possessed on them quantities for their personal use, but the law also allowed on consumption. So using urine tests and um, I mean, making sure that people that consume are still being sued. So taking off that uh, to some extent, the liberty of judges and their capacity to judge was a huge problem. In fact, representing a democratic um, in, in, in a democratic judicial not to have the capacity of discretion of judgment is very problematic. It had ended up with having a majority of people incarcerated for simple consumption of a substance like cannabis and for simple consumption, actually, not trafficking, nothing. And that has also been concentrated among young men. I mean, we can see the numbers. We have the numbers and the data from the press, mostly, etc. And so the impact there has become from a law that was supposed to be really a deterrent for young people not to go into using illegal drugs have become a law that has supported the incarceration and supported the destruction actually of the future of, of young people. And we can see it since 2011, that law has also been used against some of the people that were, uh, that were, that were in the marches that were calling for freedom and for, for democracy. And also there were so many movements against it since the time, like Sajin 52, like wonderful young people that have been fighting around Tunisia, et cetera, around it. So the law, the, the drug policy in Tunisia, to put it very simply, is disproportionate. It is, does not respond to its own objectives, which are the reduction of production, of trafficking, and of consumption and is creates many, many, many harms and will continue to create harms because we forget that because of the international situation or the international drug trafficking and production, we have a route of trafficking that is very surveilled, for example, on cocaine, which is Central America and the Caribbean. And now it's going, so basically now the production goes from the Andean region to Brazil, 
crosses the Atlantic Ocean, comes to West Africa and goes through North Africa, including Tunisia, of course, back to markets in Europe, etc. So it is a new route. So we see that when we say new route, we say substances arriving, but not only transiting, they stay as well. And they become also a illicit commodity in the illicit economy. They are consumed, et cetera, et cetera. So not only to say that we have, there is a very bad normative framework to respond to the current issues, it has created harms, but it's also not there to prepare the future or to respond to what is upcoming as challenges. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, can I ask you, how does Tunisia compare to some of its neighbors? Well, I would say that the situation, if we just speak about the south of the Mediterranean, we cannot say that Tunisia is, Tunisia is harsher than others. It has always been. But since the reform in 2018 and the removal of that Article 12 that was, that was making it mandatory for judges to send people for one year of incarceration, it became a little less harsher. But let's say that we take it from whenever we go east, it becomes more punitive. I am. I don't want to say less punitive because it remains very punitive. Like if we go from Morocco, which is the Western, the most Western, just for consumption, you have the risk of incarceration between two months and a year. And, you know, you go to Tunisia, it is about a year to three years. And then you go all the way to Egypt and it's three to 15 years for consumption. So it is a pattern of more and more punitive. Unfortunately, I don't think that there is in the region any, any country that has been showing you know, that movement towards something else. Nevertheless, in the northern of the Mediterranean, it's a very different, it's a very, very different story because we can find countries back in the 90s, like Portugal, for example, and it's a very famous model of decriminalization who have chosen something very, very, very different. They chose not to change their law. I mean, drugs are still illegal, but de facto, instead of arresting people that consume because they do not harm anyone else other, they might harm themselves. They might have some harms related to petty crime, et cetera, et cetera. But it's better to address that through getting people to the right services, if they need the services, of course, or to get them through paying a fine if they don't need the services, if they're using just recreationally and just occasionally without any issue. And that has lowered the economic and social costs instead of choosing the incarceration and saying, oh, this is a criminal, we are going to get them into prison. So, yeah, I mean, unfortunately or unfortunately on whatever we want to look into it, this is a situation where we can find more of the more sustainable responses in those countries that have been called before and in the, until the 80s and the 90s, the consuming countries, because they have found out solutions to their populations that consume. Of course, they funded the war on drugs in the South. They fund, they made sure that the war against trafficking, et cetera, remains there. But they have found solutions that we could lack into in North Africa to address the consumption issues among youth. And, and, and of course, balance it, taking out the harm, but also using the benefits as we do with everything in public policy. Mm -hmm. I know that Morocco last week announced that it's going to change some of its laws, uh, perhaps decriminalize cannabis um, with some qualifications. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that and how that might impact upon Tunisia, if at all. Yeah, no, thank you so much. I mean, Morocco has always been a very interesting case study to some extent. So Morocco is known as the, as the world's biggest producer of cannabis. And nevertheless, Morocco does have a transparent and clear methodology of how it calculates its production. And that is, has been established in 2007 through a study by the government with UNODC, et cetera, et cetera. And we don't find the same clear methodology in Nepal or in India or in Lebanon, et cetera. But let's take it from that point of view that Morocco is the biggest producer. So now what the country has decided to do was instead of, it is two legalizations that are totally allowed under international law to some extent. So you have on one hand, what we'd call the industrial and hemp, and there you have a very limitation of THC that could go from 0.2 to 1%. So the psychoactive element in it is very limited. And so that hemp can be used in different, you know, it does not need necessarily drug policy control or drug control laws because there is no drug element in that discussion. It could be used in, in cosmetics, it could be used in construction, it could be used in a variety of things. Now, the other discussion which remains more complex is the medical system. And how do you ensure to have 
cannabis and a medical as a medical good. And that is where Morocco is going. They're setting and they're including also the issue that they have of farmers of the north. So basically, because also we say the biggest country, but it's also concentrated among the reef population in the mountains of the north, a population that also has had economic, social, and historical um, specificities around the country. Um, under, I mean, be it under the Spanish protectorates or afterwards. So there has always been a very specific history for that region. And now what the country is trying to do is to put in place an agency that would buy basically to some extent all the products that all the farmers that will be making for the medical production and to sell it afterwards into pharma companies or into, uh, or, 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 or into the actors of the medical system. Now, the whole idea, just to go very briefly, the whole idea is to make is to transit to some extent from an illegal to a legal economy. And it is a very, very encouraging first step. It is really to some extent saying that we are starting to understand that we could use cannabis as we use nuclear power, as we use so many harmful other goods and, 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 and chemicals, etc., that we could use the good side of it to some extent. But we are, again, in a debate that has happened in, for example, California or happened in other places in the world in the 80s and the 90s. We still do in our region security like if we were in the 80s and the 90s. And we do not want to accept the fact that recreational use might also be um, self-medication use that, or, or, or that recreational use is just okay because it does not harm anyone. Um, we are not getting into the discussion of, you know, we just say the medical, but people do not understand what that means. We don't also take with us the population to try to explain the differences, the differences of what conditions, the differences of how the product will be, that the product could be used as oils by a grandma. It does not need to be consumed as smoking in the street, etc. So we don't take the populations and we also do top down. So we have a political issue on how we approach it. And we also have, of course, this like lack of information because because policymakers have not shared that right information. They continued from the spirit of the war on drugs, the war on drugs. I think that Morocco now is taking a very good first step. I think that if it implements well, which means takes into account really the, the points of all the stakeholders. So defending the farmers, but ensuring that the patients are involved, ensuring that the doctors, et cetera, et cetera, that everyone understands what it means and its implementation could give a best practice to other countries, to Tunisia, for example, to move on. I mean, we could go back and talk about the reform of the law 52, because I mean, Tunisia has been, for example, just to set an observatory has been taken now over, over six years to put in just an observatory, just to collect data, for example. But I think that Morocco could really uh, put set an example. And that is why the implementation is really key there. But again, the medical market and the industrial market remain limited and people that consume will continue to do it. And the medical market will not obviously respond mm -hmm. to the issue of the illegal market, which is much bigger and includes all the uses of people, religious, ceremonial, for fun, for self-medication, for pain, et cetera. Gotcha, gotcha. Let's talk a little bit about the 2017 amendments because it seemed for a while that Tunisia was going to move in somewhat of a progressive direction and sort of shore up some of its policies, but a lot of those things didn't follow through. Uh, can you say a little bit about that? Well, I mean, I think that it was a lot of hope at the time. I mean, I, I don't want to be, I remember at the time I was very much following up with discussions on, on Tunisia and it was also a former president Qaid Sibsi who had introduced this even as a promise in his 2014 campaign. And then he had introduced it during his first time to really set, I mean, it, it was never, never a perfect uh, reform. It was quite a shy reform. It was a reform as I would call similar to what the France would do. You know, it's always that we are never going all the way, but we still try to do something. So the reform at the time, that article that, so it had, I would say, five big elements that I see that were important at the time. It was, of course, to remove the article 12 because it was not possible to, you know, to tell judges what to do. And it was not possible to send kids for smoking one joint. I mean, this is, was incredible. To, to destroy someone's life like that and to send them to overcrowded prisons where there are no services, no education, no nothing. I mean, the privation of liberty is a serious matter. It should not be taken that lightly. It is about their the life, the economic life of the country. You cannot invest in a young person in their education and health for 
20, 25 years, and then all you get to do with them is throw them in a cell that is overcrowded actually by 60, with 60 others. So, I mean, it, it was not the perfect, the most perfect reform, but it was important. So that article that passed was wonderful. Unfortunately, we see that judges themselves still need a little bit more education on this specific issue with the judgment that happened a few weeks ago. So we see that there is still need for information and education is key. But this is also the key. This is the problems of prohibition. Prohibition has made people so certain. They think that it's the right thing to do. You know, they don't question their certainties around this. But there were also other important elements. I mean, we've spoken about the observatory. Having an observatory is key to understand what is going on. Unfortunately, Tunisia was approaching and trying to work with people like you know, like the UN Office of Drugs and Crime, etc. I mean, that's really great to have that kind of technical assistant, but an observatory that would measure arrests and would measure seizures, I mean, those are the most useless data in the world. <laughs> you use, a, you, you arrest a seizure. I mean, every week we hear about a new record and no one wonders why, because those roads are already used because the seizures have already been in, involved in the price of, by, the, by, the, by, by criminal elements. They know a certain percentage will be arrested. They know that route is a test. If it gets arrested, that route has already been left. Another one has opened somewhere else. So we need to go a little bit deeper into social sciences and into really this and to really trying to understand survey-based, et cetera, what is going on in the country, what are the substances used? I mean, for example, we know that in Tunisia and, and Algeria on opioids, there's a lot of use of buprenorphine, of subutex, the French subutex. I mean, but that is very specific for those two countries, but we do not have much more than the French data on, you know, diversion. Mm -hmm. So we need to know what is going on on the ground. There is the treatment centers. And again, uh, the what does it mean treatment centers? I mean, that the law wanted. Treatment centers have to be voluntary. They cannot be mandatory. And throughout the Arab world, we do have mandatory treatment that judges can prescribe. It is incredible to have judges prescribing health therapy. This is never seen anywhere else. And who want their children to be prescribed any sort of treatment by judges? It does not need to be about rehabilitation. Dependence in the international classification of disease of WHO, it is a, a disease, a chronic disease that includes relapse. It is something that we need to take into account. So treatment centers need to offer a variety of, of, of treatment options, going from abstinence for people that can and want, all the way to maintenance throughout lifetime. If, if people cannot do otherwise. And it's also, again, not a state to say what to do and what not to do. It is about a therapeutic contract between the doctor and the person to choose where they start, where they end, et cetera. You know, a therapy is also can start here and go there and change depending on the person's needs and their life. We see also the diversion, for example, what we would call the, the decriminalization. And it is mostly not arresting people if they're carrying the first time, but then the second time they would be arrested. You know, the first time you send them to social health services. I mean. This is again targeting the same populations. It's going to be the impoverished people. It's going to be the people that consume and that are already known. And police will go raid exactly the same corners of the streets and arrest them the same. You know, so when we have this like re repeat offender, or, like first time offender, it's just first of all, you never arrest people in their first use. So you are not preventing them from reusing again. And second, it just turns around and goes. You know, like in Malaysia, for example, the mandatory treatments, you always end up with the same people. They go out they get arrested, they come back. Yeah. So you don't change much. So decriminalization really is to accept the fact that people would consume. And if they're not harming anyone, they have not to be criminalized because criminalizing them has a much higher cost on the society later. And yeah, again, that was the last one was the judges to appreciate the most uh, appropriate sentences. And there again, there is a need to move out of a very um, punitive environment state of mind. Just to briefly say, I mean, sorry if I'm taking too much time, but in general, there is a need to take off 50 years of prohibition. I mean, it's very easy to say, just say no, how hard could it be? Just stop, just don't consume, etc. Nevertheless, we have to understand where the system comes from. In Tunisia, like in Morocco, there was a ceremonial and traditional use of mild forms of cannabis. 
that has happened way before the system. We have to understand that drugs were not forbidden, that were not banned actually by any system until the 20th century. So it was in 1912 that after the Opium War, there was the first convention in the world, the Hague Convention on Opium. And cannabis and coca entered into it until 1925 and the Geneva Convention under the League of Nations. The whole system was, bit, was then put back. I mean, there were a variety of, of, of conventions that came afterwards, but I mean, those four pre-UN conventions were put together, the three Geneva Conventions and the Hague Convention were put together into what we call the Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs in 1961. What did that convention really do? It classified, it was, as I said, a public health intervention to classify substances that are dangerous for people. And so we put in tables, but again, how do you decide which substances are harmful? You do it on the basis of addictiveness. And so you look into the studies and which is addictive or not. But then who negotiates? We were in the 1960s. Your Africa was being decolonized. Europe was in phase of, restriction, of reconstruction. So it was the United States. But then you leave alcohol and tobacco outside of that framework because importantly and socially and culturally and commercially they're important to you. You call cannabis marijuana. It comes from somewhere else. It's not from where you are. Opium is with the Chinese. It's not yours. But tobacco and alcohol are yours. So you push them with marketing and you, and you build everything else and you stop it. Again, well, even that system did not really work well to some extent because pharmaceutical companies could not get access enough access to the substances they needed for the medical sector. So you build up a second convention in 1971 when you had a unique convention in 1961 on psychotropic substances where you make the access to even, even to uh, uh, um, synthetic substances, you make it much easier in 1971. And that is the convention of 1971. It makes, it really is, some, some people call it the framework convention for pharmaceuticals. And then again, you see that nothing works because the problems are there, because demand is still there, because, um, because supply is following, the issues become bigger. In Latin America, you arrive to a certain situation in the 80s where a, position, a situation that was in the Andean region very, very um, concentrated or contained in Peru and in Bolivia, you go and you go at it with a war like crazy and then that just you know, explodes and the big cartels become many, 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 many smaller cartels because it's the other families working for them that move all the way in Central America and Colombia, et cetera. And so what was really small, you make a huge, because you don't even know who is in front of you, what they have and what they don't have. And they have a market regardless that they will defend no matter what. That market is in the hands of organized crime. It's never been by the state. So let me, and so you, sorry. Can I just ask you on that point? Because it, it flows naturally into me playing devil's advocate a little bit, right? So the, the argument is also put forward that, you know, if we do de decriminalize or, or reform drastically a drug law, that it's just gonna benefit the illegal activity on the street. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, the black market and how uh, amendments to drug laws and decriminalization even might affect illegal activity and in what way? Yeah, no, thank you, definitely. I mean, the problem that we have there is, so, Drug policy reforms how to address the illegal market. The illegal market, as we say now, we know nothing about it, honestly. I mean, what we know is what intelligence can say, an arrest of small scale players. It's very rare to arrest the kingpins and the high level workers or to understand even how it works. Um, the ramifications are so complex. It is transnational. It is with many different groups. It works also as opportunistic that groups work together and then separate, et cetera, et cetera. And organized crime generally approaches its business as making money regardless of what you're trafficking or not. So it is not about a choice, et cetera. This is, we see, for example, the development on the fentanyls and all these synthetic opiates that are very, very, very um, strong because they're smaller, to con so easier to conceal. They're much more potent, et cetera. So, the market in itself is what the United Nations referred to as an unintended consequence of the control regime itself. So because the regime has decided to prohibit and demand was never stopped and could not be stopped because it's the human impulse, 
there is that market that has been created and that have grown, 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 and the demand continued and it still increases till today. Production and demand still increases. So to think that there will be a deterrent, if prevention has never really worked because prevention has always been totally, totally unscientific and unrelated to reality. Telling people that you're gonna smoke a joint of cannabis and end up injecting heroin is a joke to tell kids that. They go out, they smoke a joint and they see that they're not wanting to inject and they're like, older people lie. The police officer that came to our class lied. So this is, you cannot stop that demand. And of course, the supply will always adapt regardless. I mean, it will adapt with new products. It will adapt with synthetic products. I mean, we see synthetic cannabinoids killing people because, because the market is so hard that they cannot get access to the plant-based, which is much milder. So basically, whenever we do that, what we call also, the balloon effects, the UN calls it as an unintended consequence, is whatever you put all the force on one area because you think it's problematic, you're just, you know, pressing a side of a balloon. It's just going to move somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And it's going to go somewhere else and never change. Now, to how to address them. The market is very, very, very difficult now. To, to undo. So it has to be done little by little. When we speak of decriminalization of use, I mean, just before decriminalization, let's talk about, for example, for, for about harm reduction. When harm reduction services are put in place, like Tunisia is trying to do with the, and, and its law, it has, for example, substitution treatment with methadone for people that we've been talking about, people uh, that use superdexacoprenorphine to inject, for example. So when you put in place that methadone, you take a lot of people from the market already because you take them out of the illegal market and you're giving them a substitution medication. So you shrink it a little bit. When you do decriminalize, so the decriminalization does not shrink it because the decriminalization concerns only the consumers. And so those consumers just are less afraid. And whenever they have an issue, I mean, if they have a health issue, they will report it. If there are products that are very dangerous in the market, they will report it. And they were reported to the health workers, they were reported to the social workers, etc. So it is about not sending people that consume into prison because that brings out nothing. It's just as simple as that. And it is a public health intervention also because it allows people to go to services when they need. And it's also, of course, about the rule of law. You know, the, <laughs> it's very funny, but the, but the drug laws are not respected at all. I mean, they're breached on a daily basis. They are the, the laws that are the most breached. And so now we get into legalization. And legalization is the only one that has the potential to really address the black market, because there you're talking about the control of the supply for the very first time. And there you decide, of course, on the if a country decides to legalize and on cannabis is the easiest to some extent the easiest model because it does not develop the same physical addictiveness or the same harms and in, in, in certain levels of consumption as other substances um so when you do that you decide basically to enter into a competition with the existing market you have many levers. You can work on taxation, you can work on prices, you can work on potency, you can work on age of access, etc. There are two things to it there. It's very, very difficult to speak about it now because to some extent we are talking about models of legalization that are put in the ground between Canada, Uruguay, American States, Mexico this week, hopefully, and other places. So it's very difficult to speak about it in terms because they all do it in a national framework. And so it's very difficult to understand what is the impact on others that have very different policies. We see that there's more trafficking in the borders. We see that there's more trafficking in the borders of Colorado, for example. And we see that actually cars with plates from Colorado are targeted by all the cops from all the states around. So uh, yeah, it, so we don't have the comparative models yet to say to some extent, but you have the capacity really People, I mean, we see, for example, with the CBD products, we see that people go into the legality. People, as consumers, want to be certain that what they use is high quality. We want to know that, they're, that they know, et cetera, et cetera. Now, on the other hand, there are people that are driven by something else, by the potency, the, something that would be very strong, that will not be into the legal framework of the legalized market. And then they would still go there. You have people that want to follow their usual supply chain because they get along well with their supply chain and there is where you need for the legalization efforts to include also the small hands and the low level actors with expungement and with reintegrating them in the market like california and massachusetts and other places do gotcha gotcha well i think you've answered all my questions do you want to leave us with a thought or two about uh, uh lessons learned and best practices i mean i think that the most important discussion 
and the responsibility really in drug policy of policymakers is to open the debate. You know, we are coming out of 50 years and even 60 years of, 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 of one single, a single, uh, how would I say, uh, a single way of doing things. It was always about prohibition. We have to dry it up, eliminate people that consume are evil, consumption is evil. I think that at some point now there's evidence that it is not. And there's evidence that uh, those substances, of course, are just substances that are either plant or synthetic used by manipulated and used by human beings to some extent. So this is something about really focusing about people's vulnerabilities rather than focusing on the substances. We can always say we're going to make cannabis disappear. That means we're trying to make people that consume it to some extent disappear. It's not going to happen ever. And also, so that's why I would say that the most important is a societal debate, is put in police around the table, customs, put in people who consume uh, social services, health services, really educators, parents, everyone around the table, because everyone is legitimate. Fears are legitimate. Misunderstanding is legitimate, but not talking and continuing to be very uh, uh, partisan when this is not a partisan issue. It is about everyone. It touches all social classes. It touches all the people in society. And the last thing I would say that if there is a country that has thought that they can do it in the region is Tunisia. Because if there is a country where the citizen has always been also central to the debates and where people have had a voice and they used it, hopefully, much more than us in other countries in the region is Tunisia. Everyone looks up to, I mean, I do look up to Tunisia for these kinds of debates. But again, it is about maybe not to say that injustice is there. It is unbearable to think of all those young men and some women in prison for really something they should never have been in prison with. I mean, this is a norm this is a bad normative framework. This is a bad law. And we have to say that it's a bad law and it has to change. But unfortunately we have to do it incrementally so we can do it right. Now the thing is no, to get people out of prison and all the rest needs to be discussed and be put in place incrementally. Okay. Well, it sounds uh, on that front like Munother is at least taking a step forward and following civil society to have this debate and hopefully we'll be able to flesh out all these issues.